Before I leave baseball, I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your interview for, I believe, uh, the NBC News program in which you talked with Mickey Mantle. What a remarkable piece of broadcasting that was, and it, uh, it was most enjoyable to see, Bob. Thank you. It came at a time in Mickey's life when he needed uh, to tell his story, uh, if, if only to get across to the millions and millions of people who care about him for reasons that may not add up logically, but just looking at him, hearing his name, strikes a chord in, in millions of us who grew up following baseball in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and I guess he wanted to let people know that he had come to the fork in the road in his life and he had taken the right path, at least at that point, and he wanted to unburden himself of that. And so I felt good to be able to help him to do it. We are on the air with Bob Costas. Here is Grant on the toll-free in Toronto, Canada. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hello, Bob. Hello, Hi, Grant. Grant. You look great there. You could be Tom Snyder's studio host permanently. <laughs> that seemed like Grant cut in with the scores. <laughs> well, we now speaking, go to Bob in New York. Spe Bob, speaking of which, Grant, this is very interesting because now there are 17 seconds to play in the Phoenix-Houston game, and Charles <laughs> Barkley is at the line, and his first free throw is long off the back rim, and Phoenix leads it by a point. Now, Tom is a little bit concerned that perhaps we don't have the right to broadcast this live, sort of radio style, but as you know, Tom, any broadcast, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of a game are not permitted without the express written consent of the commissioner, but I have that express written consent <laughs> right here. So Charles Barkley just knocked down the second free throw, and Phoenix leads by a deuce, 92-90, with 17.9 seconds to play in the fourth quarter. If they win, they advance against either San Antonio or the Lakers. The Lakers stayed alive with a miracle finish tonight in San Antonio, I, but I if Houston have, wins, I, they stay alive. I have the, the enduring feeling Mr. Costas, that those people who want to watch the game and know the score are in fact watching the game, and if they're watching this, they chose it because they didn't want to watch the game. But you know, great, great to see live sports back on the CBS. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, that's right. I'm just trying to help out the CBS Sports Division. They don't have any inventory. I'm trying to fill in the blanks. Stop it. Stop it. It could happen to you guys, too. Anyway, Grant, that's not why you called. My question, Bob, you seem to lean towards the owners in the baseball dispute. Lean what toward the owners? In, in the, I mean in towards the players, excuse me. Okay. But was it not the players who elected to time the strike late in the season? They had leverage against the owners, but they took it at the expense of the fans who had already invested all their time and money in the season under the pretense of a conclusion. Wasn't that the ultimate sin here? Well, what they would say is that they actually timed it for August 12th to allow enough time, they thought two or three weeks, to put some pressure on the owners, and they figured the owners would cave in as they always had in the past, and this is where the owners surprised the players and proved the players' strategy to be wrong, but they would contend that they actually uh, made it earlier than they might have, that if they really wanted to hurt the owners, they would have set a September 30th strike date, collected all of their regular season paychecks, and then imperiled the postseason only when the owners pick up the bulk of their revenue. And they would say, perhaps disingenuously, but they would say that they made an August 12th strike date to allow enough wiggle room for there to be a settlement. Look, there are no heroes in this situation. It used to be that the players had the moral and intellectual high ground. That is no longer true. There is only blame to go around for both parties. Both have been monumentally stupid and both have damaged the institution in pursuit of their short-term interests. But if you look at it both historically and over the last year, if you want to assign the bulk of the blame, I would say an informed person still assigns the bulk of the blame to the owners. Grant, I'm glad you called. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, bye-bye now. It is no secret that your name was on the short list of people being considered to do a program that would follow David Letterman on CBS, something you had done on NBC for many, many years with great success. You chose to leave the later show on NBC, return to your first love, sports broadcasting, and uh, you, you, you passed on this for mm -hmm. basically what I'm told is the same reason. Uh, you, I know you love late night. Why, why do you not want to be a part of it anymore? Well, if there were a way to do one show a week, an hour a week, I think that would be great. Then you could be sure to get your best work out there. It would be the cream of the crop stuff. And there wouldn't be so much inventory that I'd have to be away from home uh, as much as I did when I was doing the full slate of sports, plus four later shows every week. And in the case of the program you're doing now, it would be five shows a week, an hour, and not just a half hour. Uh, as I did with later, and I had the Olympics coming up in Atlanta in 96 and a lot of preparation for that, and I thought 
uh, at least a few seasons of baseball before the strike hit and there's preparation involved in that. And I just wanted to make sure I wasn't spreading myself too thin. So if I had quit later on the one hand to spend more time at home and to focus more on sports, it would be a contradiction to, uh, to jump right back into it You know, it it's CBS. interesting what you say because I, I find that five nights a week is just an awful lot of television, uh, especially sure at my point in time. I've been doing this for a long time. Remember uh, the old Sunday night uh, David Suskind show? Where he'd yep. come on. You know, right now, uh, I'm not meaning to knock sports here, but on Sunday nights after the 11 o'clock news, there truly is nothing to watch on television if you don't want to watch baseball and football scores. And how wonderful it would be to have what David Suskind did once a week on Sunday night. But you see, the syndicators won't go for it because you can't make enough money. And that was a civilized kind of conversation, as I remember. I used to watch it uh, as a kid, and um, it, it was very different than the sort of you know, dregs of society that you see on most of these exactly, talk shows exactly. these days. Yeah, it, it, was, it was good stuff. I'd love to see that kind of thing. I'd love to be involved in that kind of thing myself if there were an audience for it and if enough stations uh, would pick it up. I think I'll go back to interviewing on some kind of regular basis. I don't know if it would be nightly, but if I could find a weekly type of format that would fit into my life, uh, I'd love you to know, do it. I miss it sometimes. Well, once again, you'll wind up getting what I always wanted. You know, you've been doing that to me for years now. <laughs> <laughs> Eight seconds to go. Uh, back with the final score after these messages. <laughs>